We were responsible for starting a multi-billion pound industry. It wasn't there before, really. I was not a football fan at all. I didn't know anything about football. But yes, you did try and come up with something different. That was the game. <laughs> they took a football uniform and turned it into a work of art. And before you know it, the football kit world changed dramatically. When you're a boy, you can wear a uniform. When you're a boy, other boys check you out. You get a girl. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, let's get ready to raise a glass or two, perhaps a pint, wherever you are. Can you feel the excitement? I'm trying to. World Cup, it's almost here. This coming weekend, it begins in earnest in the desert. Hi there, my name is uh, Tim Hanlon, and uh, this is Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is devoted to, of course, what used to be in professional sports. Thanks for finding us. Thanks for downloading us, putting us in your earbuds. And and yeah, soccer, again, is the topic this week. We're going to try to get into it, perhaps a nice little appetizer, um, with a very fun conversation uh, with our guest this week, Andy Wells, and he is the producer of a fun filled documentary that appeared on uh, ITV in the UK uh, in 2016, I believe it was. And uh, it was called Get Shirty, The Rise and Fall of Admiral Sportswear. And yes, a new book based on that film is out now, wherever you find good books. We'll have a a link to it on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. It is, uh, I think, largely available only in the UK. Uh, We'll have a link to the UK uh, version of Amazon where it is available. But if you grew up or remember professional soccer in the 1970s and uh, early 1980s, uh, there's a really good chance that you remember one or or many more than one uh, a, a v- vibrant, uh, colorful, some would say garish, depending on one's uh, proclivity or histories or or uh, tastes, I guess, in fashion and and uh, and soccer gear and kits, uh, but Admiral Sportswear at the time literally was reinventing what it meant for soccer uniforms uh, to be in the professional game, starting in the UK and Europe. Uh, and then, uh, yes, if you uh, grew up watching the North American Soccer League in the late 70s, and certainly the major indoor soccer league in the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, you will know and remember and relish and perhaps uh, have burned in your cornea into your memories uh, some of the the most uh, the loudest uh, and most uh, uh, just uh, fantastic uh, you know shake up the status quo kinds of uniforms that Admiral was producing at the time. And this documentary and this book and this conversation with Andy Wells is a story of that. Uh, Admiral Sportswear uh, was a company that had been uh, in existence for many, many, many years before uh, the, the 1970s. But uh, as we'll hear in our conversation, uh, the the genesis, I guess, of how to uh, rethink what uniforms might look like and the idea of, uh, again, a novel thing at the time, a replica kit that people on the street, fans, kids, et cetera, could buy that looked reasonably close, if not pretty darn close, to the real thing that they could wear wherever they like as sort of fashion statement, uh, and um, and show their fandom to the, to uh, to another level. And in many respects, uh, as you'll hear, uh, Admiral kind of was the sort of the genesis of what is now a multi billion dollar industry of. Shirts and kits and replicas and all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, it, you, you can't go to a game today and not see those on people's backs. And, and frankly, now you can even get the official ones at the highest price, you know, with your own name and the official, all that kind of stuff. But before, you know, the mid-1970s, that idea, that notion was very, very faint. And as a matter of fact, the actual uniforms uh, worn by uh, national soccer clubs or, or top-tier professional teams uh, certainly in Europe, maybe a little bit of uh, of innovation in, in the United States, but not really even. 
uh, were very kind of just plain and, and dour and 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 basic. Uh, colors were pretty basic. Uh, numbers were, uh, you know, really the only thing that adorned the uniform. You wouldn't even see the manufacturer's logo on there. Uh, and frankly, many times you were lucky to even see the badge of the actual club on the on the. Uh, certainly, didn't see the name on the back. Uh, of the person wearing that jersey, none of that kind of stuff. Certainly no sponsors, that's for sure. But we all know what what life is like today in the shirt game, and um, you know logos and all that kind of stuff is valuable real estate and valuable uh, as well for fans who uh, uh, you know want to uh, show their their love for their club. And, and now it's arguably getting a little even sa- insane when clubs have various kits not just one or two, like home and away. I mean, they're literally like every game seems to be a new excuse to have some kind of a tweak or, or version or whatever. Um, but all of that really, as we'll talk about with our guest Andy Wells this week, circles back uh, almost undisputedly uh, into the world of Admiral Sports uh, and uh, the uh, the fun conversation we have about the documentary and the book, Get Shirty. And by the way, this week, uh, you're going to uh, see in, in our social media feeds and on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com, uh, this is episode number 285, uh, a, a, a wondrous assemblage of great uniforms from Admiral that adorned uh, the dressing rooms of North American Soccer League teams, major indoor soccer league teams. Remember, I think in uh, for two years, Admiral had the exclusive uh, relationship to um, outfit all of the teams in the MISL. So if you were a fan of the, of the MISL those years, chances are you saw and probably even own uh, maybe a replica kit of from Admiral. And there was even an American soccer league team, the Columbus Magic. Um, and if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, here's a website for you, nasljerseys.com. You can literally see all of these things in their original glory, but we'll have a whole bunch of them ourselves in our social media feeds and stuff. So uh, as you listen to this episode, uh, or as you plan to, uh, perhaps uh, grab up a, a web browser either on your device or in the office or whatever and follow along with some of the great images that we have. You're going to remember some of them, and frankly, you're going to want a bunch of them. Uh, and they're around. Uh, you'll, you can find them. I think Admiral still has a, a, a bit of a, a, a licensing agreement and stuff, but uh, there's, they're also, it's a hot cottage industry on eBay and, and various sellers and stuff. Our conversation coming up with Andy Wells. Let's get shirty in a few moments. Uh, time and uh, we uh, look forward to presenting that to you, Toot Sweet. Uh, but before so, let's uh, talk to you about one of our favorite sponsors, and that's sportshistorycollectibles.com. Our pal Dean Mitchell in San Diego. You know, I just r- remembered and realized after a long time not uh, having sort of d- dug deep into it, uh, he, f- for years, uh, since almost since we began the show, Dean has been uh, highlighting our little show uh, on the website. Um, uh, he's got the calls out some of his, his favorite episodes and stuff. And uh, we uh, certainly appreciate that uh, uh, persistent promotion. But sportshistorycollectibles.com is, like the name implies, uh, just the most awesome place to find uh, truly uh, well-curated, well-photographed, um, you know, the one-of-a-kind uh, items that uh, you may be looking for or didn't know that you needed uh, in just about every uh, sport imaginable pro uh, college and and then some world stage stuff. Soccer is no exception. I think there's almost a thousand items now across things like MLS and, and the NASL and MISL and def- other defunct leagues and international and all kinds of great stuff. Uh, but not just soccer. You name the sport and sports history collectibles has a, 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 just a, a gigantic assortment of fun stuff, stuff you're not going to find on eBay, uh, perhaps maybe even better quality than eBay. Uh, but uh, check them out. If you're a, a collector of stuff from various leagues and teams of your, uh, if you haven't bookmarked uh, and uh, visited often sportshistorycollectibles.com, well, what the heck are you waiting for? And here's an incentive, a promo code. Yes, for 15% off all of your purchases at sportshistorycollectibles.com, good seats. Yes, two words or one word, doesn't matter. Promo code good seats for 15% off all of your purchases when you visit early and often at sports historycollectibles.com. Watch the spelling. And uh, we appreciate Dean and his friends for their continued sponsorship and support of this here little show. All right. We are now going to get shirty. This is a fun look back at uh, an amazing time uh, when uniforms in soccer were, shall we say, not all that much. 
but uh, Admiral helped change that. And here's uh, here's our conversation to get you schooled on all of it. Please, as always, enjoy. Stumbling across this uh, this book and the story, and then uh, unbeknownst to me, the uh, the documentary from a number of years ago, which sadly yep. is not available now, but hopefully rectified at some point. Um, so t- let, let's start, I guess, from from your personal adjunct into this story, then we'll get into the story itself. H- how do yeah. you come into trying to tell a story about a shirt manufacturer and, and why is it even important? Okay. Um, so I've been, I've been working television documentary filmmaker for 25 years. Um, I kind of reached a point in my career where I was doing a lot of um, foreign filming, um, going to conflict zones, doing some quite heavy subjects. And I think I just needed something um, to, you know, lift the spirits, you know, something joyful. And I was sort of, I think, I think I was chatting to friends. And because I'm a Leicester City supporter, um, Wigston, which is a suburb of Leicester, um, this is where Admiral Factory was. So I grew up um, around the corner from the factory. So. The, the local fanzine, the Fox fanzine, always ran pieces about, do you remember Admiral? Or somebody would write an article about working there or the kits would feature in photographs. It was all, you know, always kind of always present. And I think I was chatting to some friends one lunchtime and we were talking about the England deal, the first England deal in 1974. My friend was saying, you know, that was a huge deal at the time. You know, that was massive, you know, very controversial. First time England had sponsorship. So I thought, hmm, I wonder if there's something in this. So let's say because I'm from originally from the city, um, I started asking around and somebody said, oh, you should go and talk to to Nev. He was the um, uh, Neville Chadwick, who was the photographer who who covered. He was the Admiral's official photographer. So I went along to see him and he's got this amazing uh, library. Uh, Neville sadly passed away early this year, but Neville had this, it's still there. Obviously, it's this incredible library of photographs um, of transparencies. And we you know, spent a lot of time. He was going through all these, showing all these images. So I thought, well, there's definitely, uh, you know, there's a film here in, of, of, a, of a kind, you know, it, visually it's, it's, you know, it's very stimulating. And he said, well, you, you know, you need to go and talk to Bert because Bert Patrick, it was his company. So I went along to see Bert um, and it just happened he was writing his memoirs. So he was very interested in, in, in the idea of a documentary. So this. <laughs> Got chatting to Bert. I didn't I didn't know if there was a, a, a film there, to be quite honest. I thought it was something good. So I thought maybe I should just make a short film for myself, put it on YouTube as a sort of celebration, you know, like a 10 minute film, 15 minute film. But I didn't really think there was enough meat there. Um, so what I did was I, I put an ad on there. A piece appeared in the local paper, local evening paper called the Leicester Mercury. And I, um, I said, you know, if there's anybody who used to work at Admiral, maybe they get in touch. The response was fantastic. And from that, um, I met well, a, a couple of people quite significant. One was um, John Griffin, um, and he was living in California at the time. And um, he was the managing director. So John phoned me up. He, a friend of told him about the, uh, the advert appearing in the Mercury. And he was you know, a wealth, a mine of information in terms of the details, the deals. So that really changed the complexion of how I saw the film. And then the other person who came forward was um, a designer called Lindsay Jelly. And Lindsay's just a wonderful. She's, um, you know, just, um, yeah, um, um, you know, a creative person, a real live wire. And she was fantastic with her anecdotes, with her energy. And again, I thought, you know, I knew we'd got a film then. Um, and the other person was um, John Devlin, who some of your listeners might know from True Colors. He's a, a football kit historian. So we met John and John kind of put the context of what Admiral did or, you know, what they achieved and, and their role in sort of football kit history. So then I start, I knew I tried to get it commissioned and it's it, getting commissioned uh, without going through a, an established company is, is quite hard. So I knew I needed to start basically come up with a, a trailer or a taster tape. So what I did was I called in a, a favor from a couple of friends. Uh, one's an editor, uh, one's a, a cameraman. And I started filming the interviews at weekends or in between jobs. And um, we put together this taster tape and we put it, we 
we sent it uh, and then, then another friend came on a producer friend came on board who had contacts with different commissioners he took it to itv um which is the um one of the commercial channels in the uk and he it was uh niall sloan is the commission editor and he gave this uh, we sent this taster tape to uh, to, um, to niall and my friend phoned the other producer phoned him up and said what did you think and niall said no it's it's not for us it's not for us and my friend said you haven't watched it have you he said no he said watch it Four minutes later, Niall was back on the phone and said, come in tomorrow morning. I want to meet you. <laughs> so and then that, that's where you know, we got the commission and we got the money that enabled us to to make the fin- film, um, finish the film and, um, yeah, carry on filming, really. Well, so let's put this into context then. Uh, it, so it sounds like you're you're zeroing in on a uh, period of time, which I, I guess is concentric circle, right? The uh, England, uh, UK, uh, football in the the seventies, let's say, um, but also around the history of this, let's call it shirt manufacturer or kit manufacturer, uh, which had a uh, has a history that goes way earlier beyond uh, this period yeah. of time. So maybe a little bit about what Admiral is and was, yeah. and then in okay. particular, why this this sort of period of time and why it sparked and became so yeah. important. Okay, so the. The, the, there was a company called Cook and Hurst, who um, I think they were established about 1902, um, turn of the century, Edwardian times. Um, and they manufactured. So South Leicester, the city of Leicester, the area is known for, um, was known for um, producing clothing, um, hosiery manufacturing. Um, and Wigston particularly, there were a lot of textile companies in the south of the city. Um, so Cook and Hurst was the company that produced um, woolen underwear. So, um, and it had two big contracts. Um, one was both to do with the wars, First World War and Second World War was to kit out um, the British and American armies with their um, woolen um, underwear. So companies going along and sort of got to the 50s and it was struggling. It's, its orders were sort of dwindling, you know, life post-war was changing. Um, and this is when um, a young 20 something called Bert Patrick um, bought the company. Um, and going into the 60s, Britain was changing. Um, consumerism was um, coming in and clothing was changing. So it was more leisure wear, um, sort of polo shirts, that sort of stuff. So they started to adapt their um, order book. Um, and one of the things they got into um, was uh, f- sports kits. So at the time, they were making football kits and rugby kits, mostly for other established companies and um, things like people like Fred Perry, um, Umbro. And would, so they would fulfill the orders sp- for other companies. Sort of like pri- private labeling, if you will. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and they would. Yeah, and that's exactly what they would do. They would put an Umbro label in or a Fred Perry label in, but they actually were manufactured at, um, at Wigston. Um, and then they got to a point where they thought and this was off the back of England winning the World Cup in 1966. Um, and football became very popular and they decided that actually rather than make kits for other suppliers, they would make go, you know, paddle their own canoe, I think is the term that Bert, Bert used at the time. Um, and this this was brought about by two things, really. What, well, I think one main thing was the um, the advent of color television. So they hit upon the idea that actually giving colorful, individually designed football strips to each club, because prior to that, the clubs were very um, they wore very standardized sort of off the peg um, kit team wear, um, you know, well, say a red jersey with white collar and cuffs and that that would be it really so it, you know liverpool manchester united nottingham forest bristol city would probably you know wear something almost identical maybe the the, the collar was slightly different or different colored socks um but you know it's very generic um and what admiral did was they once they got in their first real or well, established them was the deal with Leeds united and that was towards the end of 1973 um the kit so they took over from umbra was the the club's manufacturer and they sponsored 
um, Leeds. First time, because ordinarily, up to that point, clubs would go to a manufacturer like Buckter or Umbro, and they would actually pay to have the, the their kits supplied. What Admiral did was they went and said, you let us supply you with your kit and we will pay you. We will pay you, as it turned out, I think it was um, £15,000 with £10,000, £10,000, yeah, £10,000 for the first deal. And what for that, what Admiral got was they got their logo um, on the shirts and on the sh- on the shorts. And they also had track tops with the word Admiral um, across them. Never been done before in the UK anyway. Um, but and then what they did was they sold replica versions in child sizes for the first time. So these were official official um, jerseys um, or the full kit with the manufacturer's um, badge next to the club badge. Now, prior to this, Umbro had there was an Umbro set where, again, it, it was a generic um, kit. So, it, again, going back, it could. You could buy a red shirt, but it could be for Liverpool or Manchester United. Um, and I, I actually had one of these. I had a, a blue Leicester City shirt um, that you know my parents bought me. But it, it could equally have been a, a Chelsea shirt or a, a, an Ipswich shirt or an Everton shirt. There was nothing to um, differentiate it from any other shirt apart from from the club badge. So what they were doing, they, they came up with a concept that was groundbreaking, really, um, other manufacturers had looked at the idea, but they didn't think there was money to be made. Basically, they didn't think children would have the expenditure um, to, to pay for these replica kits. Wasn't um, a couple of questions there. Number one, how does Leeds become sort of the the uh, the test for for this? Were they sort of in financial straits or what, was there a relationship or a fandom in Admiral? Or was it? I'm just curious as to how, how Leeds comes together as the first Yeah, one. well, there's a couple of versions of this. I mean, the, the one thing about Leeds was um, Don Revy, um, when he took over the club in the 60s, was um, he was, how can we put this? He was incredibly um, successful, um, but he was very savvy in terms of his, um, his approach to football. I suppose he was one of the first modern managers of that era. Um, and he wanted to change um the way that his team played, um, he, he's more professional, um, and he was innovative. He was um, seen as a pioneer. So they identified Revy because they thought that he would be open to change. Because this is a very um, conservative world at this time. You know these smoky boardrooms. Um, you know they, the clubs are owned by you know local businessmen done good really. Um, you know, quite protective, quite, quite closed, I would say. Um, so they, they, so two versions, Bert told me that he approached Reevee because Reevee used to play for Leicester city and he married a local woman. So there was, he knew intermediaries. So he set up a meeting with Revy. The other version of, of the story is John Griffin, who went up to Leeds to, um, to pitch to a uh, catalog company and the meeting got thrown out. He said after half an hour, he said the meeting was, didn't go well. So him and this other rep, they went to, to get some breakfast and opposite the, uh, the cafe was Leeds United's training ground. So they went over and it's, and it's the days when, you know, you, there was public access um, to training grounds and he went over and as the team finished their session and Don Reavy was uh, was walking off the, the training pitch, they introduced themselves and they said, well, you know, we're from your hometown or we're from um, Le- Leicester, which is obviously where you used to play. So he invited them into the office and they discussed what they were doing in Leeds and they, how they were making football kits. And um, they proposed that, you know, they Admiral sponsor Leeds United and, and he agreed. So regardless of, of the authenticity or maybe the collision of those two stories, uh, does um, I, I, I guess. It, it, so explain to me, it sounds like it was some level of success. And I guess if you're a club, right. Hey, sure. Why not? we'll get paid if you want to provide our stuff. And, and I suspect there's probably some, you know, some uh, shared economics after the fact or maybe negotiated down the road, you know, where. If replica sales do really well, well, we get a little cut of that too. It sounds like it's kind of a, I don't know, a deal you couldn't refuse, I guess. 
Yeah, I mean, from Leeds United's point of view, absolutely. Um, but from Adm- Admiral, it was a risk. You know, John said that, you know, when he was driving back down the motorway after, you know, he, initially it was £7,000 they agreed uh, with Don Rib. You know, he was thinking, how are we going to cover this? You know, it was a huge financial risk because obviously, you you know, you've got that sponsorship money. And if you don't sell the kits, then, um, you know, you're out of pocket. So, um and it's not like it's the biggest club in the in uh, in the top flight at that point either, right? Leeds? No, no, no. Leeds were actually they Leeds were massive. They were oh, arguing. Very good. You know, yeah, no, at the time that Leeds were huge. Um, you know, one of the most successful clubs at the time. Um, and it happened the, the, the whole Admiral story is incredible in terms of the uh, the the luck, the good fortune I think they had. So that first season they sponsored Leeds. Leeds actually won the title. Um, so the, the the kits took off because Leeds at that time were not just within Yorkshire, the county where they speak. They were big all over the country. You know, they were the, the equivalent of I don't I, I suppose you know one of the one of the super clubs now, like you know the Manchester Cities or the you know Arsenal's. You know, you will see you know their colours. Um, you know, there were Leeds supporters all over the country at that time. Um, so yeah, the, the kits took off, and I think John told me he said. You know, they think that spot, initial sponsorship, they, they covered that in the first week because, you know, the, 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 they came they came up with two two kits. One was the, the home kit, which initially they didn't really alter, but they came up with a yellow away kit, which they put stripes on the arms. And this at the time was revolutionary to put a couple of stripes on the arms and then on the collars. Um, and, you know, they they were just so appealing. And of course, with color television under floodlights, they looked they looked mesmerizing, really. So, so they couldn't have actually then picked a better club, then, right? That it was, no, it was perfectly, uh, per- perfectly time. A little bit of luck, but maybe not too lucky in that they went to that one. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, with the two versions of how it came about, I think they're probably both true. I think probably Bert was looking at them and was probably had you know had conversations, and then you know John just followed it up. I think that's probably what happened. Um, so yeah, yeah, no leads. Very, you know, very canny piece of business to 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 get in with Leeds, actually. Um, you know, great. I mean, it's yeah, I think it was key. I think any because there had been prior to the Leeds deal, there had been a couple of other sponsorship deals, one with Leicester City, but it wasn't particularly overt. And they had redesigned a couple of other kits for clubs, West Bromwich Albion. But again, it didn't it went under the radar with was the Leeds deal got the profile. It was it was big. You know, it was and also because Leeds at that time and Revy were controversial um, because they, they were seen as cynical. Um, so, again, it, it, it attracted negative publicity because people thought it was grubby that, you know, by getting into bed with this sponsor, that Leeds were somehow sullying the game or, you know, their reputation. I mean, that, that because the, the time it, it was. It was, you know, commercialism was still at its infancy, really. Um, I mean, particularly so if you compare it to yeah, now. Funny, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there was a sort of naivety, I suppose, about the uh, 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 about merchandise at that time. So Leeds, really, the other thing that Leeds was they they had lots of merchandise in terms of you know scarves, jumpers, hats. Um, their commercial department was quite savvy in a way that. Other clubs, certainly Leicester City and, you know, other clubs further down the league didn't have that range of memorabilia or souvenirs that Leeds did. So Leeds were, you know, they were at the forefront of of sort of, you know, exploring other revenue streams, I suppose, is, is probably the way to put it. All right. So two things there. So number mm. one, where, where were, if you will, the other manufacturers at this point like like an adidas for example seems like the most logical and perhaps most predominant at that time at that time on the world circuit i don't know about the the uh, about england and and, and the the broader well, continent but what's interesting so in the uk umbro but umbro and butter were the two main um kit manufacturers particularly umbro um so they were kind of looking on now they they thought about this themselves and it, it, it had been proposed to them and they didn't think there was money in it. So they were basically just keeping an eye. And um, there's a, one of their sales reps, there's a, uh, a man from Scotland, Bobby Brown, told me that, you know, he was going around um, to sports outfitters in, in Glasgow and he would see 
um, kids running around in Glasgow parks in the in the, the shirts of English first division clubs, which is you know extraordinary. Um, and he kept on going back and said, yeah, these Admiral shirts, they're everywhere. Um, Umbro's hierarchy said, don't worry, they'll be gone. There'll be six months time, they'll go bust. They won't, This you know, this business model will not work. They will go bust. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, Bobby, carry on. And then another six months and he said, look, I'm seeing these shirts everywhere. Don't worry about it, Bobby, they'll go bust. So they were kind of biding their time. Now, at, at this point, Adidas weren't in the picture um, they came in, I think it was about 77, 78. So there were, you know, these other manufacturers were on the, on the sidelines waiting to see, you know, whether the business took off. And of course, you know, it took off spectacularly, um, you know, before long after the Leeds deal, um, Manchester United and then England. So Admiral had signed up arguably the three biggest teams in the UK at that time. Well, just describe the England deal, because that seems to be like the the uh, the accelerant, I guess, after a yes. spark, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So so Don Reavy uh, won the title with Leeds in 1974. He then left the club and took over as England manager from Sir Alf Ramsey. So again, as I said, he, you know, Reavy was a modernizer. So he went into the FA and he wanted to shake things up. So he wanted um, he wanted to do things he, differently. He wanted his way. He wanted to bring new training methods in. He wanted to create sort of club England uh, sort of um, ethic um, to, to the team. And one of the things he wanted to do was um, redesign the football strip. So for, I think it's about 97, 98 years, England had worn these pure white shirts, um, unadulterated, um, and then these dark navy blue shorts almost black and and white socks and that was it and apart from the uh, the england crest the three lines and that was it it was just it, completely minimalist perfectly really, british if you will <laughs> yeah very understated yeah but it, you know the, I, I i loved i mean i have to say i loved it um i thought it was um yeah it was something quite special but he he what he knew that you know he he wanted to change and um, so he 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 got Admiral to come in and pitch. And what they came up with was a similar template to the Leeds United away kit, really. And in fact, it had um, two stripes. Um, so a couple of subtle changes. One, the blue went from a navy blue to a sort of like a, a royal blue. And then down the sleeves, there was a, a, a red stripe and a blue stripe. And then there were stripes on the collar. So kind of you went from this English identity to this British identity. And again, it was it was controversial. So that there were two things that the traditionalists hated. One was that the FA was, you know, doing a deal with a sponsor in the first place. And the fact that the first game when England appeared at Wembley, they had these track tops with with Admiral across the chest. So that that angered the uh, traditionalists. Um, the fact that they'd actually done this deal. And again, it was seen as grubby or, you know, almost unsporting. Crash commercialism. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Exactly that. And then the, of course, then the other, uh, the other aspect was the way the kit looked because it was, you know, you've seen this, this icon of this, this unadulterated pure white shirt had been sullied with, you know, this uh, you know, clown outfits, I think is, um, it was uh, one of the uh, com local commentators that um, uh, described them as. But of course, to kids such as myself, we love them. I mean, they looked magnificent. And especially under the floodlights. So in the book, I describe how I went to my first England game in 1976. And just to see these, this team in these kits, it was just sensational. Um, and you know, it's, it's it's an interesting point because that this is who the kits were designed for. They were designed for kids to sell to kids to make them appealing. You know, real eye candy. Um, and the, on TV, they just looked yeah, they just looked fantastic. And as you say, from from the England deal, um, you know, everybody else just fell into line. And actually, coming out of the England deal. Uh, when they did the pitch, um, they were approached by, um, I think it was Sir Matt Busby um, of Manchester United, who said, come up and see me, um, have a meeting at Old Trafford, because um, I want you to have a, I want Manchester United to have Admiral shirts as well. That's like, that's like God calling in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that, again, and they actually said the Manchester United, you won't be surprised by this, the Manchester United deal was bigger 
in terms of sales in the England deal, because obviously Manchester United, you know, have a global appeal. Um, so yeah, so their their kits sold, you know, throughout the world. All right, so let's take a step back for a second. Give me, give our audience a sense. Now we're going to have tons of visuals with social media and and all the stuff, and 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 we'll do our best to you know, and we'll get into to America in a few minutes. But um, if you can give, uh, to the best of your ability, a, a sort of a verbal description, I guess, of what sort of this, let's call it this admiral look, at least initially was, and or the the idea of why and how it was so different. Like uh, you you mentioned a little bit about sort of the striping and then the logos, but that that's kind of only the beginning. I guess colors indeed have, have a certain uh, a part of this mix too, a sort of a splashier and brighter color yeah. palette, that kind of stuff. Is that, that's a good point, actually, because what they did, and it was it was very subtle, they introduced a third color quite often. So say a club like um, Sheffield United, who wore red and white stripes, they would add black, a thin so a stripe within a stripe and very subtle. Um, but it just looked magnificent. I mean, in terms of the designs, the tram lines design is arguably the most famous design um and how to describe it so you've got manchester united had this all red track suit and what you've got is obviously sometimes called a an hourglass um design so you've got these vertical stripes going the length of the body across the down the chest and then the down the length of the trousers so you've got a red you've got you've got, you've got a black stripe within two white stripes and it goes yeah vertically down the whole length of the outfit um the other one probably the famous one i want to say would, would be west ham's chevron and it, it's a bit like a, a citron grill upside down is probably the best way to describe it and again just you know introducing different colors the other logo taping had never been done before so of course you know you've got yeah, a white describe logo taping because uh, this is yeah. this is i mean if for uh, american soccer fans as we'll get to in a few minutes uh it, it almost feels like they went overboard in some cases for some of the teams in the united states and, and canada uh, but the logo striping to me was fascinating as a kid myself wanting to buy some of these replicas uh, i couldn't get enough of it yeah no i agree it so yeah logo it's it's Basically, so you've got a you've got a, a, a plain red shirt and you put a white stripe down the sleeve. And within that white stripe, you've got lots of Admiral logos, the, the nautical logo um, going down the length. So a friend of mine, he told me this funny story that when Leicester City shirt came out, um, when he when he first saw it, he thought it was little fox heads. <laughs> he didn't actually realize that it was the, the manufacturer's logo. So. And if you if you want to see an example of uh, going overboard, it's probably the the Belgium shirt from I think the, the war in the nineteen eighty two World Cup. I mean, it is almost as if somebody has been given the brief of how many manufacturers' logos can you get on a single outfit. Because um, talking about the tram lines design, it's they put logos within the tram lines. Um, there was also I think the reason one of the reasons they did this, I think the FA or the league rules at that time specified that you could only have one manufactured logo on the chest. So that's how they got round um, basically av free advertising was to come up with the logo taping or the other place that was on collars. They would put um, the logo on the collar. But uh, but also the the colors too, right? Um, uh, there there was, and you go to great lengths in the in the documentary and in the book to kind of describe how while uh, bold and brash and and shall we say modernly interpreted, right? The, I, um, yeah. There there was a an adherence, I guess, to each team's or each uh, nation's, uh, I guess, color scheme and or logo. I mean, yeah. there, there was a there was somewhat of a reverence still to it, so that it was authentic at least enough, yet without going too far, or maybe some people yeah. thought it went too far. Yeah, it's. I mean, what they, yeah, they so they they kept the traditional colours because, you know, why alienate the people you want to sell to? Um, so, but what they did was they they introduced you know a, a little bit of design. Um, you know, with Manchester United, there they have these away shirts, these white away shirts, and they put stripes, thin stripes, down one side. Same with um, 
with Dun, um, with Aberdeen. And just the act of putting stripes or coming up with a, you know, a design was just revolutionary. It had never been done before. Um, so, they, yeah, they, they, they going back to the West Ham, the, the, the Chevron, um, pre, prior to that, West Ham had worn claret and so the, the shirt, the jersey would be claret, but the sleeves would be pale blue. And then they introduced this yoke, I think it was called, where um, the top half of the chest was uh, was um, was light blue. Um, famously, going back to England um, after the first kit deal, they signed an, uh, another deal in 1979, made its appearance in 1980. Um where they put bold stripes, um, red and blue stripes across the, 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 the chest of the England shirt. Um, again, hugely controversial. You know, people, you know, traditionalists were absolutely appalled. And again, you know, kids, you know, such as myself just thought it was, you know, fabulous. Well, it sounds like that uh, the kids indeed were kind of that kind of drove uh, that. And, and I, I guess that at that point, um, probably the money was following too, meaning that the business model looked like it was, it was working. So I guess that meant more teams, not only locally or regionally, but even globally, were starting to say, "Hey, we want in on this." Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. So that's when the likes of Umbro and Adidas, you know, piled in really, and they they muscled in on the market, and. Um, yeah, and they effectively took over the market. Um, so they, they they could offer more money, basically, and and that that's you know that sort of led to the demise of Admiral. Sadly, was that they they you know they created this market, but actually they created a monster. Um, and you know the other company, you know, they just had bigger budgets, you know, and they they just squeezed them out of the market really. But but in essence, though, Admiral kind of set the blueprint, right? And I, I'm really curious as about sort of this mid to late 70s, maybe early 80s, where it just seemed like they they probably could do no wrong. And it seemed like there was no club or a historical crest or color scheme that they couldn't wave some magic modern design goodness upon. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think it's really interesting actually looking at the designs now because I think they still stand up. I think they still look great. You know, given that the 70s was, you know, hardly renowned for its sartorial um, elegance. Um, I think, you know, some of these kits are great. Um, no, I think they what they did, you know, they're very bold um, and, yeah, just distinctive. Um, if, I mean, if you look now at some of their their designs, you can immediately tell what club you know a certain sort of combination of stripes or chevrons you know if you see the going back to the west ham chevrons if you see that as a logo you immediately think of west ham um and, and yeah they, they yeah i just think they um their kits were just uh, phenomenal interestingly i mean one of the most controversial kits um was the brown chocolate brown coventry city i was gonna get to that go ahead yeah so so it's um so that kit was intended for Ipswich Town originally. Um, so Bobby Robson had kind of made noises that he liked this um, this uh, this shade of uh, sort of chocolate brown for an away kit. And then once once he once he saw the prototypes, um, he he sort of backed out of the deal effectively. And um, it was Ipswich were going through a rough patch at the time, and he just knew that the the kits would be used against him if the results carried on, you know, going, going badly. So, but unbeknown to Bobby Robson was that um, John Griffin had, the managing director of, of Admiral had ordered up um, whole rolls of chocolate brown material fabric. He basically jumped the gun because he thought it was a done deal. So he was left with all these rolls of fabric. So he was trying to offload it. So he was phoning around. So he phoned Sheffield United. And they said no. He phoned Leicester City. They said no. So nobody would touch touch this 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 brown kit. Um, and then one day, Jimmy Hill phoned out of the blue. It was fuming. Um, so he'd found out that West Ham was getting more sponsorship money than Coventry City. And um, quick as a flash, John Griffin said, "Okay, well, I, I'll give you equal money, but on one condition: you take this brown, you take a, a, a chocolate brown away kit." And that, that's how Coventry ended up with the, with this this away kit that 
it, I mean, it, it really is Marmite. It, you know, it, it divided people then and it, it divides people now. I mean, it has been described as uh, the worst football kit ever. I mean, it's certainly iconic, um, but certainly the Coventry City supporters um, I, I know and have spoken to, they, they have, you know, huge amount of affection uh, for, for, for the kit. Um, I mean, it certainly, it was, you know, certainly distinctive. Um, going back to Neville Chadwick, the photographer, he told me that, um, photographing it at night and evening games during the under floodlights, he said was just really tough because it just, it didn't show up because, because we all with all the other kits, they kind of, you, they were, as you mentioned, they were very colorful, very bright, very bold, but actually the, uh, the, the chocolate Brown kit was probably, um, yeah, probably went against that actually how much were you able to kind of discern about uh its leap to um the american soccer scene uh, at the time um because when you what you just describe right um it almost feels like what admiral had done in the mid 70s was just so perfectly suited for the bright colorful yeah. whatever this was in pro soccer in the united states at that yeah. time the nasl yeah. and it's and it's and it's uh, tributaries with the American Soccer League, and then it's mm-hmm. uh, uh, it's indoor uh, mutant uh, uh, yeah. prodigy of the major indoor soccer league. Yeah. Talk, you know, it, it almost feels to me like these are two situations almost made for each other, right? Um, yeah, and it's, indeed. It's, for a while, it was the case. Yeah, interesting point. And you know, I don't go into probably as, uh, enough detail in the book, which I, I probably should have done. But that be, that should be for the second edition, by the way. Yeah. That's just me. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's there's plenty of uh, yeah, there's plenty of material. There's lots of uh, other things, stories that uh, we didn't have space for. Um, and one of the, the the American angle is really interesting because with Bert and John, so they were massive American sports fans. They used to visit America regularly. This is before Admiral took off. So when when they stopped making um, underwear, they were getting into casual wear. And one of the markets they were trying to crack was America. And this is before the, the, the sports kits. Um, so they went to a lot of American sports. They loved the whole razzmatazz, the look of it. And that's what they brought back to the UK. Um, and that's the look they were going for. And going back to those, um, those track suits I, I talked about, I mean, that – that's pure evil Knievel. You know, he would have worn, <laughs> he would have worn one of those tracksuits, but, but that's the look they were going for. You know, they, they clearly took their influence from uh, American showbiz, I suppose. Um, and you know, they, they brightened up, um, English football, but in many ways, the, the natural home was America because that's where the influence came from. And when you look at those American kits, they, they even pushed it even further because I know that, Within the boardrooms in some of the English clubs and Scottish clubs, I know there was this tug of war uh, going on in terms of what they could get away with. Whereas I think in America, they could actually have freer reign to uh, you know, express themselves more. Um, and you know, and the, the, the look, I think, for some of those um, American clubs, I think it's just fantastic, fantastic. I think that's where admiral wanted to go with their kits i think they that, that's almost their natural home i guess yeah and, and and if you look back at sort of the mid to late 70s i mean umbro and, and adidas obviously were were uh, pretty prominent in say the north american soccer league stuff but um i guess where uh and you alluded to it earlier i guess where uh, it really kind of uh, harmonized in the states was indeed this replica kit idea. I and I remember being a Cosmos fan back in the day. I grew up in the New York area, and um, I remember in the, uh, uh, the Kick magazines, the uh, game programs that were uh, sold at uh, at these NASL games, uh, there was an Admiral ad, literally featuring uh, most, not all, but most of the NASL teams at the time, and the ability to buy it to get a replica jersey, and I. I get, I geeked out all over that, uh, and um, I, I just you know to me, I, and I, again I don't know how large that that uh, uh, that was in terms of of um, how much uh, how much money that generated with a relatively smaller soccer fan you know uh, 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 group here in the United States, but um, to me that was just like this is awesome. This is like the first like replica thing I've ever seen in sports. Yeah. And I think what's 
you know what's interesting about well, I've got, there's another story I'll tell you about. What's interesting about you know nowadays you can pretty much you know there's obviously counterfeit, there's you know lookalikes. You know if depending on your budget you can find you know you can buy almost anything to suit your budget. Back then there was only you know an admiral shirt. There was nothing else like an admiral shirt. You couldn't buy a cheap copy of an admiral shirt because they were unique. Um, and one of the things uh, they were very expensive as well. So because I lived um, in, in the city, um, there were different outlets that used to get the factory seconds. So the uh, the garments that were faulty and they would sell them. And one of the things that we would go and you, kids at school would buy a Southampton shirt or a Norwich shirt, even though they they weren't fans of those clubs. But they wanted an Admiral shirt with the with the logos on. And then. I always remember this one day we went to our local hardware store, which is the where we used to buy these secondhand, these, um, these, these faulty shirts and kits. And then one day we turned up and there were all these American kits and it was the excitement. So my, so I bought a Tampa Bay Rowdies shirt. So they, they were my other team and all the kids. So in this sort of Leicestershire school, and it happened all over the county, you know, we're running around in all of these, you know, Tulsa roughnecks. Um, oh, I'm trying to think what the other, I'm trying to think what the other ones, the um, most common ones were. Tampa Bay Round is definitely. Um, but so Minnesota Kicks, that was the other one. So the, all, all these other kids were running around with these American shirts on. So all the all my friends had a second or had a their a second team was an American team. So it's quite bizarre that you've got all these, uh, you know, all these English kids running around in American tops in the mid 70s. But they, it was so exciting because they were just so they sounded so exotic. You know, the names were exotic and the kits, as I said, you know, I think Admiral just pushed it a little bit further. Um, with the designs. A couple of things on that. So that, that are kind of curiosities to me. So for example, growing up as a Cosmos fan, I swear to God, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably as deeply, you know, uh, rooted in terms of all kinds of arcana around this team. I swear to God, I did not know that Admiral for one season, I think it was 1978, was the actual manufacturer of Cosmos jerseys. Now, they did something a little different because they had Ralph Lauren, because they were owned by Warner Communications as a designer but they, I guess the Cosmos didn't want or an agreement was made not to have the Admiral logo. It was kind of, I, I think it was quietly admitted that Admiral was the producer, but they didn't sort of take on the full Admiral yeah. stuff, if you will. Yeah, there's, in terms of the sponsor. Yeah, you know, Admiral did that. They, they've done that with a few clubs in, in England as well, where they made the kits, but they, they didn't have their um, their logo on the outside. Um. Bert Patrick told me a story. Um, I, I don't know if it, this features in Bert's book, um, but he had a New York Cosmos um, tracksuit, a yellow tracksuit, um, as you say, designed by Ralph Lauren. And he said it was absolutely magnificent. And he went to play tennis or squash one day at his club and he hung up the uh, the tracksuit. And when he came back from playing, somebody had stolen it. <laughs> He was. He said he was absolutely gutted because he never managed to get another one. But he said, uh, "Yeah, so somebody, uh, yeah, sauntered off with his prize and joy." Well, here's the other question I, I kind of have around that, though, is that um, so? As I remember, and as I did some of the research, and I sent you a couple of uh, links for the uh, someone who's even gone further with the jerseys, and they literally go year by year and and, and uh, iteration by iteration. It, it looked like Admiral had uh, an agreement with the North American Soccer League for. Yeah. Uh, I guess you could call them official replica jerseys. However, that did not mean necessarily that Admiral was the provider of the official uniform of said team. So, for example, you mentioned the yeah. California, well, a California surf, for example. Mm -hmm. They never had an Admiral official jersey, yet that was one of the replicas that I bought. So they, I yeah. guess, approximated it for yeah. the commercial use for kids yeah. like me. But that that was always an Adidas team yeah right so I want, yeah. i'm wondering how i maybe it's it's a question too far beyond but i i'm just curious as to i guess the licensing was kind of almost before being the actual kit right um because you know adidas and and even umbra had a bit of uh a chokehold on some of these teams um and admiral was not able to sort of benefit from both of them but just at least one of them on the replica side yeah i know that phil woosman did come over to the to england 
came over to London and they and it, it, you're right. It was about licensing. So what Bert and John bought, they told me, was they bought the license to manufacture the shirts in Europe, um, certainly in the UK. Um, beyond that, in terms of their US agreements, I don't know uh, what was agreed. Um, but certainly that's. That's what, how they came to, to manufacture them, certainly in the UK. But, yeah, it would be down to the licensing. Um, but I, I know there was, a, a, I say, a sense. But with both Bert and John, they felt they never cracked America, as they put it. That, that, that was their big hope, that that would drive the company forward. Um, but, that yeah, I think they, they felt that they had come up short uh, and it was it was beyond them, which um, yeah, I know they both um, you know kind of regret. Well, it's it's really interesting. I mean, uh, you look at some of the uh, the ones where they had both the uh, official uniform contract as well as the uh, obviously the the replica rights. I mean, the Atlanta Chiefs, for example. I mean, red and white and blue and the old logo and very yeah. splashy, very memorable. The um, you know the Detroit Express and the Minnesota Kicks you mentioned. Yeah. Um, lots of great color palettes uh, to work with, but I, you know, to me as a as an American soccer fan, both now as well as back in this period of time, um, I I think you know it's it's really interesting because yeah, he well he says he may not have cracked the U.S. market. There was yeah. an one undeniable and and oft forgotten sort of deal that um, I think kind of really was a a large uh, a flag plant at the time. They got the entire. Uh, a year or two's worth for all the teams of the major indoor soccer league at that time, yeah. which at that time was, I think, three or four years on, was almost literally killing the outdoor game with this much more exciting, faster brand, uh, yeah. multiple goals, you know, off the boards kind of thing. And uh, to me, that's almost like a coup. And in many yeah. respects, I think even was either the ultimate, for better or for worse, expression of creativity for uniforms uh, in North America, those those major indoor soccer league uniforms. I, I don't know how much you got into those or how many uh, photos you saw of those, but um, some of those are really off the wall, literally. And yeah, yeah. What what year was that, Tim? What year so, are we talking? So the the MISL started uh, in earnest, I think the uh, the the winter season of 80, 78, 79. and I think by nineteen eighty eighty one, they were uh, the official uh, kit supplier. And I'm, I'm guessing also two um, uh, replicas for the MISL. All teams had MISL. Okay. Because what happened was, so in 1980, so the the company, the original company went bust. And it was bought by um, a Dutch company called Frissel Oil. And what, what Admiral struggled with for a long time was um, – global rights, selling the brand around the world. Um, but Frissel came on board or bought the company. And then they they were far more successful. They had bigger reach. So they basically had this franchise system from 1980 onwards. So um, a local business called, man called Peter Hockenhull, he was based in Leicester. He bought the UK franchise um, for Admiral and they stayed in Wigston. Um, but I know... Frissel, then a man called Nico de Vries, who was involved in other sports, um, uh, Dutch football and um, cycling. He then sold different franchises around the world. So I, I suspect that was probably a deal that he brokered. Um, and that was certainly something, you know, I think he had far more success than um, than Bert and John did in terms of um, the sort of the global reach of the brand. Oh, that's so that's interesting. So you're saying 1980 or so was kind of a demarcation point for the company and and maybe that because as I look at some of the old MISL uh, jerseys, like for example, the St. Louis Steamers, which is one of the more creative and and um, and it takes full advantage of the um, uh, the sort of arm strip with all the logos down the uh, down the side, actually only halfway down right down to the elbow. Um, 78, seven, so I think the team started in 79. So 79, 80, they had it. And then in 80, 81, they had it as well. 
it, it almost, I, frankly, now that I look at these and some of the design tweaks between those two seasons, I wonder one of which might have been under full ownership and the other, what the next one might have been through this licensing thing afterwards, after the sale. Yeah, it could be. Um, because I know that also the the design team changed as well around that time. Lindsay, Lindsay Jelly, who we mentioned earlier, um, she'd gone by that time. Um, but they were also some of these kits were they were template kits, effectively. Um, you know, going back to the um, the tram lines, there were a lot of North American clubs who had that. I think about half a dozen from memory. Um, I think Vancouver had certainly had it. Um, so, you know, some of those designs did stick around. But as you say, I think purposefully they were uh, reworked or um, I don't know, enhanced, I suppose, for the for the U.S. market. Um, where, as I say, I don't think they had the. Um, the opposition that they had in, the, in some of the UK boardrooms. Now, it's interesting. I mean, you look at things like the Cleveland Force of the early 80s and, and some of their logos. I mean, they even took the the idea of the Admiral uh, logo uh, sort of repetition thing, and they just took the Cleveland Force's logo and did that around, say, the 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 body of the shorts uh, as the trim of the shorts. I mean, just – and it was it was Admiral as the logo, right? But I could see and, – and, and now with this sort of understanding and, and subtext that maybe this was – a licensing deal and some liberties were taken since. I, all of it's fascinating. And again, you know, when you look back and look at all the the memorabilia and that kind of stuff, it even gets more more intriguing. But I guess uh, to sort of put a cul-de-sac around this, describe to me though why just when it seemed like they had, I don't want to say cornered the market, but had created the market, right? And others were rushing in by the late seventies, early eighties. Why was it that they couldn't keep up and or they had to do licensing deals or sell the company and that kind of stuff with they had outgrown their success, so to speak? Um, yeah, kind of. I mean, it was, it was almost like this perfect storm. So there, there were lots of factors going on. I mean, one was, you know, more competition. So the likes of Umbro and, um, uh, and Adidas was, were effectively squeezing them out of the market by, I think, that first Manchester United deal that um, – added um admiral brokered was i think it was worth fifteen thousand pounds and then when they re-signed again with with manchester united towards the end of the 70s i think it had gone up to a hundred thousand um and that was in the space of i think about you know three or four years so that that was that was going on um also politically socially um british manufacturing was was basically dying um uh, uh, one of the things for the demise that's been cited numerous times is is foreign competition. And certainly um, the clothing industry, uh, more clothes were coming in from uh, other countries. Um, so actually the manufacturing in the UK was going through this period of deindustrialization. Um, there was that. But I from all the conversations I've had, I think the problem, one of the biggest problems was that um they never expanded enough so they did expand but they never went public it was a family run business and remained a family run business and i don't think well i know they didn't they basically didn't make the next step i think nowadays as we know that you know people have, you know have successful companies knowing that you know if 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 it, once they become um you know uh, generate enough money that a bigger player will come in and buy them out. And that's, you know, that's, that's the game plan all along. But back then there was this real pride, I think, in that it was a family company and they wanted to keep it. Um, you know, going back to the workforce, you know, the people there, there's an awful lot of affection, um, you know, for their time spent there. And, you know, it's a cliche and people say it was like a family, but, you know, it sounds like it really was that people um, that is one of the things that got mentioned to me numerous times by the different workers was that it felt like a family. You know, people used to it was small enough that everybody seemed to know each other. Um, but, but yeah, that they yeah, they, they, they didn't do a deal and that there were offers as well. Um, they could, you know, Bert could have sold up or. He could have, you know, brought a partner in, but um, but he didn't want to. And I think I think that was their 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 undoing. I mean, there's you know myriad of other reasons in terms of poor management decisions. And I mean, another uh, I was told that they were signing up clubs, small lower league clubs, for fear that 
you know one of their um uh competitors uh, would sign them up but actually you know they, they just weren't getting the money um back in sales for smaller clubs um and they signed up too many from the lower leagues rather than you know sticking with the big boys um as they as they'd done initially and you know another thing was uh, it's it's a catch 22 because they they didn't want to be solely reliant just on selling replica kits so they started bringing out football boots uh holdalls so different scarves different lots of different memorabilia but that was seen as weakening their brand and they diversify too much in terms of they lost focus is is more the term that was uh, was used a couple of times so yeah i don't think it was one simple reason but maybe yeah not going public probably is the is the real reason that they um yeah that they uh, they well they went bust unfortunately so here's the obvious question what how about the what so how would you having sort of unearthed and and uh drawn a spotlight to this period of time what is the legacy of of this period of time for the company because it sounds to me like especially when you see the the promos and and uh, uh and get sort of into the uh, the thematics of, of of the book that it's almost like uh, this is the it feels to me like they stumbled across or pioneered with purpose uh a multi-billion dollar industry that arguably they're not able to sort of benefit from in the modern day yeah yeah i mean that i would say you know we've got the world cup coming up um next month haven't we or yes next month um hard to believe but yes yeah (laughs) (laughs) i still can't get my head around it but yeah so we've got the world cup so actually i don't know if it's gonna be say okay say um i went to the brazil world cup and you go you go to a stadium and you look around and you've got half the stadium in the fans are wearing well, one set of shirts, color shirts, and on the other side of the stadium, they're wearing uh, another set of color shirts. You could say that is because of the legacy, of Admiral's legacy, that they they created or they certainly pioneered um, this, what became one of, you know, a, a fashion mainstay um, of today, that this, this scratchy polyester shirt that kids used to wear in the 70s to to run around the park kicking a ball has become as you say this multi-billion dollar industry and you know that that can be traced back to this little company in Wixton and um you know when you go to the site it's extraordinary because it's very very modest and to think that you know what what sprung from there and went around the world is is it's quite extraordinary really all right. Tell us uh, the uh, tell our audience uh, the name of of not only of the book and the film and the status uh, of each of them. I know one is eminently available and just out. The other is maybe not. But uh, I, I want to be able to at least satiate the interest of our audience so that at least if they can't get get one of these, they can at least be on the lookout for. Sure. So the um, so the book has just come out. Um, it's called Get Shirty: The Rise and Fall of Admiral Sportswear. Um, it's, uh, produced by Conquer Editions, um, and it's available from their website or it's available from all the other, where you normally buy your, your books from Amazon and, um, other online, um, distributors. Um, the documentary was called Get Shirty also, Get Shirty, How a Small Midlands Underwear Firm Changed Football Forever. Um, it's not currently on any platform, sadly. But we are working uh, to try and get a deal so that, um, yeah, we can make it available for, uh, for people to view. And that originally ran on uh, the ITV network uh, in, right. uh, in England uh, and uh, was, I think, 2016 or so. And right. yeah, uh, and for our international listeners, and we have more than you, be, you would be surprised, um, I, you know, keep keep an eye out or maybe, you know, uh, proverbially email or send letters to the ITV folks to maybe, I don't know, if, if there's any sort of groundswell that we can perhaps uh, uh, push on. Um, and obviously, as, please let us know so we can tell our audience when when it is uh, more universally available so people can go go find it and see it. I, I, I've had the luxury of seeing it uh, under, uh, you know, for, a, per, you know, press purposes. And it's just, it's great. It's, it's really, it's, it's delightful. I mean, I didn't grow up uh, there, but I certainly could see how and where the NASL and MISL uh, uh, adjunct from the United States came into the play and, uh, and all that stuff. And, um, 
I, it, it has to be seen, especially for soccer fans of a certain age here. Thank you, Tim. That's very kind. Uh, and last question, what's next for you? Anything uh, from either this story or football or or sports generally? Or is this kind of just uh, your – are you back to the more, you know, uh, serious stuff as you were alluding to earlier? No. So, they, yeah, so there's um, it's quite, quite a bit to say. So um, the book has been optioned by a, a drama production company. So, I mean, these, you know, I'm crossing everything and but hopefully there will be a feature film, a get shirty feature film um, in the future. So something is similar along the lines to uh, Kinky Boots made in Dagenham, very sort of British comedy dramas um, of a certain type. So hopefully um, that will all go ahead. Um, can we get our assur- an assurance from you that we can have you back when that's ready to go? Absolutely. Absolutely, Tim. Yes, yes. Don't and, also, worry about and look, I, as I, I'd love to be an informal, we'd love to be an uh, informal consultant on that. So, in, to at least have a, a a wink and a nod to some of the U.S. Uh, uh, versions of such. So, if it's uh, you know, even if it's just a little array of some of the better and worse uniforms of, of the in the U.S., it would be great to ha- see that in there too. You know, I think the um, well, I do know the the producers are very keen on an American angle to this story. Um, because obviously to get backing, um, yeah, it would make sense to it would uh, feel to me like a men in blazers kind of thing to me. But uh, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, I'm not privy to any information, but I could see Raj and uh, and Devo being interested in, in it. But I digress. <laughs> um, uh, what am I working on? So I'm working on um, a couple of films at the moment. So I'm just finishing off a sports film. Um, one, it's called Punch Drunk. It's uh, about a boxer from Northern Ireland from Belfast it's called Eamon McGee and it's about his life he's probably one of the taglines we've used is probably the the greatest boxer you've never heard of um so it tells the story of his career growing up in basically what was effectively a, a civil war during the 1970s and how he emerged as um yeah one of the one of the best boxers of his generation um but whilst he was boxing he um Eamon is an alcoholic and he was drinking whilst he was boxing so there's there's two facets to it. one is telling his the backstory of his his career and his background and then we follow Eamon today um who is st- still struggling with his addiction sadly um so uh yeah we're just about to finish that off um and then yeah um Again, we're looking for a home for it, but we're putting it into film festivals um, either towards the end of this year or beginning of next year. And um, yeah, we, we want a, a global audience for that film. Um, and then the, the other thing I'm currently working on, we've just started, is um, it's a film for BT Sports um, over here. And it's about English soccer in the 1990s. Um, I can't go into too much detail at the moment. But, um, yeah, it's it's shaping up well. And, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a, an interesting watch, hopefully. That's great, too. We'll keep an eye out for that. So um, this has been awesome. Thank you for taking all this time. I know it's uh, getting late now. Thank you. This has been great. I don't know when we'll put this out. We put, we publish every Monday. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly within the next uh, – I don't think I can do it next week, but probably maybe that November – let's see. So this is the th- – tomorrow's the 31st, daylight savings time. Oh, my God, already – I'm looking maybe the 14th, so that would be two Mondays from now, and hopefully still prime and uh, uh, getting people uh, uh, with the book's availability or recently uh, being launched and all that kind of stuff. And uh, over time, so I'll let you know, um, we'll uh, socially promote the heck out of it. Uh, we'll use a couple of your um, uh, of your Twitter tags and stuff to kind of cross-promote on that front. Um, I'll give you a little advanced listen. Hopefully you like it. Going over, over time, any new developments um say with um uh, finding the um <clears throat> sorry now i'm losing my voice which is good now <clears throat> yeah when if you're able to get um any knowledge about when uh, the documentary is uh, finds a home uh some other places and that kind of stuff because we'll always you know update our audience about that kind of stuff so sure yeah i mean yeah it'd be, it'd be so good to uh you know to get it on a platform it really would um hopefully we can get that deal done um but to I say have- and again, I loved it. I, I just I can't get away for for other soccer fans <laughs> to, uh, to 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 envelop and enjoy this too because it's it's great and it needs to it needs a it needs an American audience in particular because those late seventies early eighties uniforms are remembered by many people. 
Yeah, no, they they're just phenomenal. I, you know, it's something somebody said to me. They were just the the perfect accompaniment to to seventies, eighties football, and I, I think it's true. I think that's exactly what they were. Um, they were just so of it, of its time. I think um, you know, said in the book is that you know they they looked how um, David Bowie and uh, Mark Boland sounded, and I think they did. You know, they, they that's where they took their influence from was from the high street. You know, it was everyday fashions, um, and that was reflected, which um, you know hadn't never been done before. The other thing I was thinking is really interesting is that you know their their logo had parity with the club badge for the first time. In a way that had never been done before. You know, the likes of Manchester United didn't even have a club badge on their jerseys up to, I think, about 1972. As incredible as that sounds, and they weren't the only ones. Lots of clubs didn't have, even have their own club badge. To have, so to have a manufacturer's badge have that prominence that early on is, is, is quite extraordinary, really, what they did. Told you it would be fun. My goodness. Uh, so many great jerseys and, and team memories, at least from the United States perspective, for sure. If you uh, if you remember in the late 70s, I'm, I'm thinking the California Surf. I'm thinking uh, the Minnesota Kicks. I'm thinking the Atlanta Chiefs. Some really amazing uniforms that Admiral was producing at that time in the NASL. In the late 70s uh, and early 80s, also, every stinking team that existed in the MISL during those years, those first two, two and a half, maybe three years, were outfitted by Admiral. Yes, the Hartford Hellions and the Philadelphia Fever and all those teams. Uh, and yes, even an American Soccer League team in, in the form of the Columbus Magic. There might have been a, a few others, I'm not sure, but the ones I could certainly tell. Uh, but all of that is great Admiral stuff and part of the story. And if you uh, remember any of those soccer uh, teams uh, and leagues back then, boy, oh boy, uh, then um, uh, this book uh, is for you. The book, again, is called Get Shirty, The Rise and Fall of Admiral Sportswear. Uh, it is available generally wherever books are found, but uh, a lot of them, uh, it just came out uh, in September. And a lot of the sites I think that I've seen uh, largely are domiciled in the UK. So uh, if you go to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com, just search up this episode number 285. Uh, in the uh, description there, you will have uh, find a convenient link that will take you to the UK version of Amazon, where you'll be able to uh, to purchase said copy. You can also go to uh, the publisher's website. It's published by uh, Conquer, C-O-N-K-E-R, C-O-N-K-E-R, Conquer Editions. Uh, if you go to conquereditions.co.uk slash shop, you'll be able to find uh, not only Get Shirty, uh, but also tons of other great uh, books, largely around uh, UK and um, uh, English uh, soccer histories and stuff, uh, badges and stickers and uniforms and, and all those kinds of things that uh, uh, just make great, great uh, stuff for the, the uh, European soccer fan, shall we say. The documentary uh, that came out in 2016, also called Get Shirty, uh, was uh, put out by uh, UK television network ITV. Uh, it is not currently available. Uh, there is discussion that it might be reissued uh, relatively soon, uh, but I would check your streamer uh, subscriptions uh, and we'll certainly let you know, too, uh, when it comes back out. I've had the luxury of seeing it uh, for preparation for this show. It is a hoot. And yes, there are a number of uh, U.S. team jerseys that uh, make an appearance uh, that will jog the memory. You can follow Andy Wells in a couple of different places directly at on uh, Twitter at Broccoli Blue. That's uh, B-R-O-C-K-L-E-Y Blue, B-L-U-E, at Broccoli Blue. Uh, you can follow uh, the adventures of this book, uh, Get Shirty, as well uh, at the Conquer Editions uh, Twitter feed. That's at Conquer, C-O-N-K-E-R, Editions. And uh, also another uh, thing you can follow that Andy is uh, a contributor to called uh, on Twitter, at Got Not Got. Got, G-O-T, N-O-T, G-O-T, Got Not Got, uh, which I believe is kind of a, a, an assemblage of of people uh, with uh, great um, memorabilia trading and, and things that they're searching for on the hunt for. Uh, all those are great places to follow Andy and his uh, endeavors. And um, if you want to follow us, please, by all means, do so on Twitter. We're at Good Seats Still. 
uh, at least for the time being. On uh, Facebook, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. And on Instagram, you'll find us also at Good Seats Still Available. Um, let's see. On, tw- on uh, YouTube, yes, we now have our official handle. Uh, and yes, we publish to YouTube all of our episodes. So if you want to stream them there or download them from that that angle, you can do that too if you're just not a podcast uh, uh, pro at this point. Uh, yes, there is a YouTube channel devoted to us, and that uh, that handle is also at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, website, again, you know it, GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. Uh, email is hello at GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. And um, our thanks, of course, to the great Dr. Jerry Payne for all his uh, knob twiddling excellence this week and uh, enjoy the football that is the soccer the world cup version let's hope it's uh memorable uh and uh as you uh you know uh have turkey or or uh get ready for the holidays hope you're gonna squeeze in some soccer uh from uh, the world stage until uh, next week hopefully we'll uh, see you and uh thanks for listening bye-bye